Well, good afternoon, dear audience. It's great to see so many of you here, especially when the weather outside is so wonderful and the cafes in Zagreb so tempting. So it's nice to see you and thank you for coming. We appear to have a slight technical hitch. now seems to be rather more serious. Start again. Well, what I want to do this afternoon um, is I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about what started off looking like a very straightforward installation of a virtual private network at a customer's premises. But like all the best stories, um, there turned out to be several interesting little routes down which we had to wander before we could get this installation to work. Um, and these are sort of fairly major gotchas in the installation of this VPN. But in order to tell this story, um, I need to set the scene, which is what I'll do in the first five minutes of the talk. And then, just so that we can all be up to speed with the acronyms and the terminology used in virtual private networks, I'll spend 10 minutes running through that fairly swiftly. And then I'll spend the last 15 minutes um, talking about the interesting stuff. So what we see on the first slide here is basically just a brief review of some of the technologies we can use to connect a satellite site to our main campus, or um, a remote user, maybe working at home, or a mobile user, um, also connecting them to the campus. Um, clearly, private lease lines are still the method of choice for connecting a small site to our main campus. Um, in the UK, these come in two flavours. We have what British telecommunications call Killerstream and Megastream circuits. Um, these tend to be 64K and 2 megabits. Um, we also have rather newer technology called LES circuits. This stands for LAN extension services. Um, these are pretty much dark fibre circuits that come in either 10 megabits per second or 100 megabits per second. The difference between a Megastream circuit and a LES is that the latter tend to be unmanaged. Um, uh, they're fast, they should be reliable, um, they can be expensive, they're normally useful if you're in a metro area, but the minute you step outside a metro area and you get out into the countryside, then quite often there just has to be too much digging construction to put these circuits into place. Um, alternative methods of um, connecting a remote campus, clearly ISDN is um, reliable, well-tested technology. Um, it's ideal if you're placing a few small calls in the day, if you want to keep the line open 24-7, then ISDN is probably not your best choice. The call charges are going to ramp up pretty quickly. In the UK, we have this other interesting technology, which is referred to as EPS9. This is basically just um, dry copper. Um, it is um, voice-grade copper that runs from your main campus into your telephone exchange and then runs from the same telephone exchange to your remote site. So providing your satellite campus and your main campus are both connected to the same voice exchange, you can use an EPS9 circuit, so you can buy um, simple voice grade copper, and you can use that, and you can drive it up to two megabits per second. That's rather reliant on distances. Um, oh, and it's probably worth noting that for the EPS9 circuits, um, that circuitry doesn't go through any active technology. It is literally just dry copper that only goes through the distribution frame of the exchange, so it doesn't go through any electronics at all. And then finally we have um, ISP or VPN services for remote user. Um, private dial-up service is a possibility or alternatively a VPN via an ISP. So there's a very simple representation of um, a traditional two megabit circuit connecting our satellite campus on the right to our main campus on the left, not very interesting. Um, here's a slightly busier slide showing 
a traditional method of providing your own private dial-up service to a remote user. Um, the user is connected to the public service telephone network, as you can see on the right, and then the main campus of the university um, buys a box quite often with the name of the Ascend Corporation stamped on the front, and the user dials um, into the university's own dial-up service, and they're away, they can connect to the file servers. Um, here on my slide, I've got a radio server providing user authentication. Um, down at the bottom of the slide, very, very briefly, I don't wish to linger here excessively. On the left-hand side, I have a list of the problems associated with running a dial-up service like this. The startup costs can be very high. You have to buy all of that primary rate ISDN. You have to buy all of your Ascend kit or Cisco kit. The support burden can be quite high because quite often um, you will be supporting your users in their um, remote dial-up, but quite often that can, that can flow over into supporting their own private machines at home and their own private laptops. Um, and so quite often you can end up spending a lot of money on support issues. Limited to 56K analog dial-up. And then the last item, I can't really remember what I meant here. I've got limited service, but it, it's gone. Um, a big advantage of this is that you really have very good security because you're not going through public infrastructure. Okay, so the alternative to those pr two previous slides is that we set up a VPN. Here you can see a very similar situation. On the left, we have our main campus, and that has internet connectivity using a router. And then on the right, we have a home user connecting to some commercial ISP and also a um, mobile user connected to the ISP. And the only point of contact between those three points is the internet, and so we're using public, thing, public infrastructure to shift private data. That's a VPN. Um, it's a highly flexible solution. You can pretty much do what you want to do if you're smart enough. Uses existing infrastructure. Your university's 10 meg connection to um, your national REN is there, whether the remote user is using it or not. Quite often, remote and mobile users will want to use um, the VPN uh, during evenings and weekends, which is when your um, users at your main campus aren't using your expensive connection to your REN, and so it makes good, efficient use of existing infrastructure. The main demerit is clearly there are complex security issues to solve. Okay, so here's my little representation of the ingredients that we have to throw into the pot to make a VPN. Um, we have tunneling. We'll get onto that in a minute. So that is really the essence, I think, of VPN. We need encryption services so that we can make sure that the evil hacker doesn't somehow siphon our private data away once it's released onto the public internet. We need authentication of both the endpoints, the data from the user, and then we need some sort of IP framework to tie all of those um, algorithms into um, an IP network. Um, for this talk, I'm going to say nothing further on encryption. I'm going to say nothing further on authentication. I'll say a little bit about the RP framework, and I'll say a fair amount about tunneling. Okay, so this is the point where we start to bring everybody quickly up to speed on um, VPN technology. Um, tunneling is used to deliver packets over the public internet that in their native state would not be deliverable over the internet. And so if, for example, we want to shift a protocol like IPX from a remote campus to the main campus, clearly we can't do that directly over the internet. The internet only routes IP. If you want to use the internet, you've got to use IP. So there, but there may be circumstances where we want to shift IPX. Alternatively, we may want to shift IP packets that use private addressing, and clearly we aren't going to be able to move those around over the internet. And so we need to use tunneling to shift um, diverse protocols and private IP addressing over the internet. Uh, there are two main classifications of tunneling. There's so-called layer three tunneling. Um, the main methods here are GNE, generic route encapsulation, and IPSEC, IP security. I'll have a fair amount to say about those two later. Um, there's also layer 2 tunneling, which is when you take a frame, quite often a PPP frame, and then you tunnel it. I'm going to say nothing more about layer 2 tunneling because that's just a dead end for the purpose of my story. Okay, so layer 3 tunneling, uh, very briefly, 
Here we have a simple example of layer 3 tunneling which uses the GRE protocol. At the top of the slide, we're taking a simple IP packet that consists of an IP header, a TCP header, and a block of data, and we're going to tunnel it using GRE. And you can see that there are three protocols involved in the GRE tunneling process. There's the passenger protocol. This is the little IP packet we want to shift. There's an encapsulating protocol that provides various services domain to the tunneling. That's, in this instance, GRE. And finally, there's a carrier protocol. That's the protocol that is going to carry our tunnel packet. And in this instance, again, it's IP. It usually will be IP because we're using the internet to do our tunneling. But the passenger protocol, as I said, can be anything. It can be Apple Talk. It can be IPX. Um, again, usually it's IP these days, but often IP with, private, um, with a private destination address. Um, here's a fun little slide um, that uses all of the animation facilities and PowerPoints. Um, on the left-hand side, we have our um, privately numbered file server on our main campus, which is connected to a router. Um, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that the router, of course, has two interfaces. It has an Ethernet interface, which is privately addressed, and a serial interface connecting to the Internet, which has a globally routable IP address. And you can see we have a little laptop with a real-world IP address, which gets its connectivity via the Internet. So we start off where our laptop wants to shift a packet with a destination address 192.168.17.26, which it can't do over the internet. So the first thing we do is we do our GRE encapsulation. So we've got our bigger packets. That changes the destination address. The destination address in the outer IP header is now the internet-facing address of the router at the campus. Uh, we now shift the packet over the internet and it's residing on the router. Um, we now decapsulate, we've regenerated our original packet and we can now finally deliver to our privately numbered file server. That's tunneling. Uh, a virtualized dear audience, I'm moving on, moving on, moving on. Okay, so IP security is a set of protocols that are used to mix in encryption and authentication algorithms and um, allow them to be applied to IP packets. There are three protocols involved. There's authentication header, IAH, which is um, uh, an IP protocol, um, protocol number 51. This just provides authentication services. There's the well-known ESP, which provides authentication and confidentiality, so if you want to encrypt your data, you have to use ESP. And the joker in the pack is Ike, IKE Internet Key Exchange, which is used for the initial negotiations between your security peers. And IPSEC can also run in two modes, tunnel or transport. We'll miss that one out. And we'll talk about the IPSEC modes, and then we'll get on to um, my big story. Um, this is actually fairly germane to the rest of my talk, so eyes straight ahead. Okay, we can apply IPSEC in one of two modes. We can use IPSEC to both provide authentication and confidentiality services to our packets and also tunnel the packet. So IPSEC really does deliver everything we might need for a VPN. Or alternatively, we can use IPSEC just to provide authentication and confidentiality services. Um, in the first method, uh, we're using tunnel mode IPSEC, and in the second, we're using transport mode. So, Looking at the two diagrams, at the top diagram, you can see that we um, have two machines, both with private IP addresses, that want to talk to each other in a secure fashion. The key point here is that the security peers are not the same as the machines engaged in the endpoint conversation. Those two machines are the PCs. The security peers are the two routers. And so um, we need to use tunneling to um, move those privately numbered packets over the internet. And just down in the right-hand side, you can see a representation of the sort of packet we would use. We have our initial little packet with an orange IP header, and then we've encapsulated it using either AH or ESP as our layer 4 protocol, and then a new outer IP header as our carrier. Further down, we're looking at transport modes. Transport mode IPSEC is normally used where the two machines engaged in the end-to-end -end conversation are also the security peers, and that will normally be the case 
when those two machines both have um, globally routable IP addresses directly bound to them. And as you can see, I've tried to represent this not as two machines connected to local Ethernet, but as two machines with direct connectivity to ISPs. And again, the Internet is providing the, um, uh, the linkage between the ISPs. And so in this instance, there's no need for any tunneling because the machine on the left can quite easily send non-secure packets to the machine on the right, so why can't it send secure packets? And as you can see in the representation of the packet, all we've done is we've taken our original IP packet and we've just spliced an, EA, an AH or an ESP header in between the IP and the TCP header. That's transport mode IPsec. The advantage of using transport mode IPsec, um, if we're able to, is clearly there's 20 bytes less overhead. So that can add up to quite a lot less overhead for um, a lot of large packets. Okay, so we now have um, just about 10 minutes, Madam Chairman. Um, we now have just about 10 minutes for me to get on to the interesting stuff. Um, let me describe in words what we're trying to achieve here. The University of London Computer Centre sells um, a lot of internet connectivity to various organisations in the London metro area. These are organisations who are not entitled to a funded connection to Janet, which is the UK's REN, but um, are entitled um, to a so-called sponsored connection whereby um, a, an institution with JANIC connectivity sells part of its bandwidth and carries the sponsored institution's traffic. And the way we do this is we put in a 2 megabits, it's usually a 2 megabits line between ULCC and the customer, and then um, we route the customer's traffic over the internet for them. And you can see this in the right-hand side of the diagram. Um, the customer's router is connected to ULCC via a 2 megabits per second line. And the other salient point in this diagram is that our customer also has some local Ethernet, which is privately numbered um, with a classy network 192.168.540/24. So that's the um, existing infrastructure. We have a customer actually based in the Barbican in the centre of the City of London, if you're familiar with London. It's the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. They're one of the top conservatoires in London. And they have a 2 megabits per second um, internet con connection via ULCC. Now, GSMD um, have a lot of students who come from abroad, and they have um, some rather nice student residences called Sundial Court, which is a few streets away from their main campus. But unfortunately, they really didn't want to spend the money on putting in their own private infrastructure between their main campus and Sundial Court. And so Sundial Court um, was a little island. They could get internet connectivity from any ISP, but because it's a student residency's office, they needed access to a secure access to um, the database giving information about all of GSMD's students. And this is where we come in. And what they wanted was they wanted um, a magic box that would give them both internet connectivity and would also give them guaranteed secure access to the um, private LAN um, on the main campus. And so if you look at the left-hand side of the diagram, um, the first thing we did is we recommended that they purchased a commercial ADSL solution. And um, that consists of, again, another router. We'll describe that equipment in more detail in a moment. Um, which is just connected to a telephone socket, and that gives them their internet connectivity into this little student residency's office. And again, they have their own little bit of local ethernet, this time with addresses in the 192.168.00 range. So we'll just go back to the previous slide. The equipment at the remote site um, consists of what I call a wires-only ADSL connection. This is um, a facility whereby you can order ADSL connectivity without having to buy the routing equipment that the ISP would like to sell you. So you really do just get um, an ADSL connection and you have to provide your own router and your own expertise to configure it. But it's cheap and the other advantage is that you can do what you want. You're not tied to using a router that British Telecommunications have provided you with um, but you don't have the passwords to. And so it's ideal for our purposes because we want to do all kinds of clever stuff that BT wouldn't normally do for us. And so we have a wires-only ADSL connection that comes with one static IP address. The other equipment, clearly we need a splitter, and that does the frequency demultiplexing because we're using our telephone socket both for normal voice calls, same as always, only this time we're also multiplexing um, the ADSL traffic onto that. 
And then we also have a little Cisco 827H router, which consists of an Ethernet hub with four ports and an ATM port. In the UK, ADSL connectivity is always provided as PPP over ATM, never Ethernet. Okay, we've already seen this. Now, the story gets interesting when we consider that um, the student residencies office, the little satellite campus, needs to do two things. They need ordinary internet connectivity so they can browse the web in lunchtime, um, but they also need that secure access to um, the private network at the main campus. And we have a conflict. There is a conflict between using network address translation on the router to give all of those PCs on the local ethernet the internet connectivity they need, and IPSEC. And I'll say a little bit more about that conflict in a moment, but for now, accept that um, there are two things they can do. They can either um, accept packets um, from the local ethernet and pass them through the NAT process for standard web browsing internet connectivity, or they can take packets from the local ethernet and um, pass them through the secure tunnel. So the way we make that decision about um, whether the packets are going to be NATed or whether they're going to be tunneled is in the routing table. We have um, a couple of static routes in the routing table, there's a default that says route everything through um, the local dialer interface, that's the main egress interface on this router. And there's a slightly more specific static route that says any traffic for the private network on the main campus, send it through the tunnel. And so you can see here in this little flowchart, ordinary internet traffic takes the A route, takes the A train if you like, it goes via the routing table through the NAT process and then out into the big wide world. Um, if the destination address for the packets corresponds to that private 192.168.54 range of addresses, um, the packets are routed through a GRE tunnel interface on the router, and that then causes them to have IPsec applied, and then finally they're sent out the same egress interface on the router. Um, it's probably worth observing that it's a really bad idea to try and do IPsec and then pass it through NAT. Um, there are many reasons for this, and if you're interested, the IETF published an internet draft very recently, um, actually in March of this year, which talks about this in great detail. There are many, many incompatibilities between IPsec and NAT. One of the worst ones is that for the hardcore IPsec fans here, you'll know that authentication header authenticates rather more than the data in the packets. It also authenticates all the unchangeable fields in the outer IP header as well. So it provides a little bit of protection for your outer carrier IP header. And clearly, if you're going to then run that through a NAT process, well, the NAT process is going to start changing the source and destination addresses, which will immediately invalidate the ICV that AH has calculated for you. So it's bad from that perspective. Um, and there are other incompatibilities. I'm running short of time. If you want the details, then look at the security section on ITF's website. So trying to tunnel something and then pass it through NAS is a bad idea. You have to do one or the other. Um, finally, and Madam Chair will be delighted to hear this is my last slide, although it's um, also a very busy one, um, we have an interesting problem, and I've called it fragmentation hell. What's going on here is that on the little ADSL router, we end up, unless we take precautions not to do this, we end up fragmenting packets um, twice. Um, if you look at this slide, we start off in stage one with a packet approaching the router from the local ethernet, and that's a 1500 byte packet, so we're up to our maximum transfer units already. And on Cisco routers at least, um, packets are fragmented before they are GRE encapsulated. Remember, GRE encapsulation carries 24 bytes of overhead, and so if we're taking a 1500 byte packet, we're definitely going to have to fragment it before we do the GRE encapsulation. And so that then results, finally, in two packets, a little 68-bit GRE encapsulated packet and a 1500 byte GRE encapsulated packet. Um, so having GRE encapsulated our packets, we then apply um, ESP. And in my particular system, um, the ESP headers carry um, an extra 30 bytes of overhead. Bear in mind, we're using ESP in transport mode here because we've already used GRE to do the tunneling, so we don't need to use tunnel mode IPSEC. And 
we've created a 1538-byte packet, which again is too large to pass through the egress interface, so we have to fragment again. We're down to step five in the middle, where we now have two little packets and one big one. And finally, we can send all of those packets on their way over the internet, they reach the destination, and then the um, last two fragments have to be recombined, the IPSEC decapsulation happens, the GRE decapsulation happens, and then the final two fragments are recombined, not on router 2 this time, but on the destination host. The problem with this system is that um, the recombination of the last two fragments happens on router 2, and that is process switched on the router, not fast switched, and it absolutely kills the router performance stone dead. You can start off with a Cisco router with a nice high performance VPN hardware module in it, and this kind of double fragmentation will pull the performance of that kind of system all the way back down to doing all of your IPSEC under software. It's that bad. And so you really want to avoid this if at all possible. Clearly, the way you avoid this is you set a sufficiently low MTU on your tunnel interface such that the initial fragmentation um, fragments um, just enough so that the addition of the ESP header does not require a, a second fragmentation. And by setting an MTU on the tunnel interface of 1438, um, you have to fragment once because the GRE encapsulation requires an initial fragmentation. So if you're going to do that, you might as well fragment the packets down enough so that neither of them are going to go above the NTU when the ESP header is supplied. That way, you only do a single, a single fragmentation. Uh, the real killer advantage is that the recombination this time doesn't happen on router 2. It happens on the destination host. And the destination host is very good at re recombining fragments. Routers don't like recombining fragments. Um, and they certainly can't fast switch them as well. The final comment. Why are we using this arrangement? Why are, you, why are we using transport mode IPSEC over a GRE tunnel rather than using um, tunnel mode IPSEC? The reason for this is this enables us to protect our tunnel packets from the network address translation. Um, because by routing those packets through the tunnel interface that requires the GRE encapsulation, we can then route them keep them routed away from the NAT so they never get through the NAT process. It's a way of protecting the packets destined for the main campus from the NAT process. And so we avoid all of those horrible incompatibilities between IPSEC and NAT. And so just to summarize, we have a situation where we have a satellite site with ADSL connectivity. They're using that connectivity to both gain internet access and um, to provide a secure tunnel over to the main campus. Um, this secure tunnel is provided by means of GRE tunneling um, and transport mode IPSEC and we've um, seen why we need to do that so that we can either NAT the packets or not NAT them and we've also seen one of the little gotchas involved in these multiple encapsulations. You can end up with multiple fragmentations and you, you can end up having to recombine those fragments on um, one of your security peer routers if you're not careful. You don't want to do that, it kills performance. If you take the precautions I've mentioned, these guys have ended up with a great system, they're really happy. ADSL's always up. Of course, their URCC 2 meg link is always up and well managed, um, and they're happy bunnies. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Which I probably won't be able to answer, but there we go. question. Um, um, how Sorry, I can't hear you. Testing. How does uh, the setup work uh, if you want to access the website which uh, runs on, let's say, a, a Spark machine with Sun, uh, Solaris, was, uh, which uh, sets don't fragment, and uh, the website uh, has a firewall in front of them uh, filtering the ICMP uh, um, uh, pass MTU exceeded messages. Right, um, we're not actually doing um, path MTU discovery here. Um, what, what do you do if the other side uh, does that? Well, it, it doesn't really seem to be an issue for this particular installation. 
I mean, we 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 could um, we could, I suppose, um, configure matters to do path MTU discovery, but it's it's something that um, I didn't really consider to be that necessary. Um, what they want to do um, works fine because bear in mind that um, uh, they're only using this IPSEC secure tunnel um, to access their own database. That's all they use it for. What mainly what they're using it for is the um, staff in the satellite office will come into work in the mornings and what they'll want to do is they'll want to log on to their Windows domain so they use the secure tunnel to do that they'll want to connect to the database using it's actually an SQL server database um, so they can do that um, everything else they want to do is just sort of web surfing um, an email so the things they're using the secure tunnel for are pretty well defined because they're defined by the facilities available on their main, on their main link um, so that kind of answers your question, I think. Um, it's not so sophisticated that they want to do really clever things. Thank you.